What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Good morning. My name is David Breer, and welcome to episode 26 of the 11FS Fintech Insider Breakfast Show, brought to you this morning by our good friends over at MyTech, who provide tomorrow's identity verification for today's uncertainty. And uncertainty we pretty much have right now, don't we? In this show, we bring you the best and the brightest from around the fintech and banking landscape every single weekday, straight into your homes for you guys at 8.30 BST here on LinkedIn Live. Our lineup this week is pretty sick, I have to say. Uh, tomorrow we have Deval Gore, who is the uh, over at London and Partners. On Wednesday, we have former CEO of Virgin Money and CEO of Salesforce, uh, as well as founder of a super interesting startup called Snoop, Jane Ann Gadia. Uh, Thursday, we have Eric Wilson, the CEO of a challenger over in Australia called Zinger. And on Friday, we have the Ecom OG himself. Mr. Nick have been in way too many billion pound businesses to mention, but today, uh, I'm really, really happy to be joined by Benjamin Enser, who is the Director of Research over here at 11FS. How's it going this morning, Benjamin? Really well, David. Good morning. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm enjoying your Space Invaders background. I know, right? I, I mean, I kind of made a made a few improvements to uh, to the lighting and to the the setup here as well. I figured if we're going to be doing this for a couple more months, then uh, you know, I really should uh, make a bit more effort. So, um, so today, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be talking about the new research report that was released by Eleven FS last week. It's all about the impact of COVID nineteen, as you would expect right now, but specifically focusing into the financial services industry and what we believe that the pandemic will actually happen. You know, what will it actually do? Uh, and in our opinion, it's about probably accelerating digital financial services. Um, we'll get into that in a second, but as, as always, guys, uh, if you've got any questions, uh, chuck them over onto LinkedIn. Uh, we can uh, answer them and weave them into the chat as we go along. Um, and if you know anybody who should be listening or watching to this, then uh, like tag them now, get them involved. Um, maybe, Ben, if we start with you a little bit, uh, you've only, you're only just joined 11FS, what was it, six, seven weeks ago now? That's right, which was an uh, unusual time to join because uh, yeah. a little bit of time in the office before um, before, before we shut down. Before um, everything kicked off. Um, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about your background um, pre-11FS and then what do you do at 11FS? Yeah, so I started out as a journalist in the city of London covering um, derivatives markets, things obscure things like repos and securities lending. Um, then uh, when the internet started taking off, I joined a small research company called Fletcher Research that was looking at the impact of the internet uh, on business, which was obviously going to be a big thing. Um, that business then got acquired by Forrester. And at Forrester, I led, uh, I built and then led a global uh, digital financial services team researching the impact um, uh, of new technologies on, on the whole industry. And then I joined uh, 11FS to um, help drive the growth of our business, um, to help all of our consulting clients uh, around the world um, with first-class research to help them build uh, better propositions for their customers and build human-centric digital financial services. Nice. Uh, I mean, I, I always think um, everything begins with, uh, with insights. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people who go in the wrong direction, probably at full steam, but building something that's not necessary. Um, I guess uh, from from your perspective as well, you know, building from really solid bases of knowing factually things that either customers or competitors or businesses does, it, it changes the game, doesn't it? I mean, a lot of people, I think, um, lose research at the beginning, and that leads them to just doing the wrong thing, doesn't it? I think it's really about starting with customers, and it's those those insights into into customers. To your point, because. It's so easy to make assumptions about your own behavior and assume that other people are like you. And of course, they're not. Um, some aren't, some aren't. And one of the best outcomes sometimes can be to realize that actually nobody needs your product because then you save you know, millions of pounds or dollars developing something that nobody wanted. Um, so that constant course correction from continually checking with your customers is the best way to develop a proposition. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, lots of people jumping on LinkedIn this morning. Uh, good morning to uh, Yules, all the way over from Indonesia. Good morning, Charles Lane. Good morning, Martin, Neil. Uh, good morning, Zara. Uh, lots and lots of people jumping on this today. Uh, Fish, good morning. How's it going? Uh, Deeper, good morning as well. Uh, lots and lots of people jumping in. Again, if you guys have got uh, questions, if we really sort of start getting into it, feel free to hit them up on LinkedIn. Uh, Benjamin, how have you been dealing with uh, remote working? Um, I'm not really sure what your what your setup was when you were at Forrester, whether you worked remotely sometimes, but going from 
a few weeks in the office at 11FS to literally 100% of the office remotely. Um, how's that transition been for you? So it's strange in that it's much easier to get to know people face to face and building trust with people through video is much harder um, than when you can really get to know them. And you really miss the, the social side of getting to know and trust colleagues and the sort of serendipity of just seeing someone doing something. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, having been part of global teams um, for the previous 20 years, it's not such a huge shift to me because I previously had times where I was the only person in my team in, in London. Um, so I've got very used to trying to learn how people are doing. Um, one of the most interesting things is trying to spot when a colleague is struggling, because often people won't say when they're struggling with something. And some, so you sometimes have to ask, are you okay with that? Did you understand that? Because uh, sometimes people won't say, I'm lost, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, completely agree with that. I mean, I, I've found, uh, I've said this a few times on social right now, it's the ones who are really, really quiet that are the, the ones that you need to look at, because uh, I, I'd sort of describe it in the same way as uh, paramedic attending the scene of an accident. Uh, they don't go to the people who are shouting loudest because they're alive. They go to the ones who are, are quiet because they might be in the most trouble. And uh, I think, like you say, put, uh, looking for those signs, looking for that right now, um, it's a really stressful situation, isn't it? I mean, both on a personal and a professional level, I think um, not many people will have experienced this type of thing before. But um, so, I mean, how are you staying sane in the this, this period then? Because obviously, um, the um, the level of uh, um, sort of uh, consistency of process and going through the I mean, what, have you managed to find a, a decent routine? So I'm very lucky. I, you know, I think there are um, you can almost divide workers into into three groups. Obviously, you've got the group of workers who've um, who've who've lost their jobs or been put on furlough and so on. Uh, then you've got another group of workers, you know, the emergency workers, the food delivery and people, you know, absolute heroes working flat out under masses of stress and then you've got the sort of semi-normal workers who are able to continue uh, working from home but even those you've got very different situations because some are partners with emergency workers or they've got uh, young children at home and so I don't have young children um, so I'm very fortunate um, so I try to you know try to have a very clear routine um, try to really stick to um, starting work uh, on time um, not extending too far into the evening Some sort of structure, uh, even though at the times when it's the you know even at the weekend we're we're getting them to do a, a little bit of uh, of uh, of work on on something just to keep them going and keep them in that routine because uh, it's amazing what the the walk to school or the you know the the kind of micros around the routine just keep them really really focused, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so um, I mean, the research report that you guys put out uh, last week. Um, days and weekends and everything is, is blurring a little bit. I've really sort of looked a little bit into, so what's the impact going to be on financial services or everything that's happening with COVID-19, right? Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what that what that concluded? Because, I mean, from, from our perspective, we've been sort of beating a, you know, digital is everything drum for quite some time, but it seems that actually the organizations that have uh, really converted to more of a digital setup have probably fared a little bit better in this period of time than the ones who, who haven't, right? That's right. Um, so we looked at the sort of short term, medium term, and long term impact. And you know, the short term impact is sort of fairly obvious, a lot of that's played out already. But as you look at the sort of medium term and long term impact, you see that uh, revenue is going to be under acute pressure across most lines of business and financial services. There's pockets where people will actually do better, there'll be more revenue, but mostly revenue is going to fall. So with revenue falling, that means you're going to have to drive your costs down. Um, or most financial firms are going to have to drive their costs down.
we've uh, lost lost Benjamin this morning, unfortunately. In terms in terms of the uh, the connectivity up there, might not be uh, quite as good as it should be. And um, what was uh, what Benjamin was saying is uh, he was looking at both the short, medium, and long term impacts of of what COVID would do. Uh, in the short term, what we're expecting is a very very significant drop in in revenue, and obviously that's going to lead to lots of different organisations having to approach. Um, dealing with that situation very, very differently. In the short term, I think if you look at um, such a significant revenue drop, then people have uh, only really one opportunity at that stage, which is being in a situation where they really manage costs much, much, much more effectively. Um, and those many of those organizations with uh, very, very high costs, particularly if you're investing so heavily uh, against growth within your organization, so those sort of medium-sized startups are I think you're probably going to really, really struggle. Um, I think on the larger size of those organizations, then people who have very good cash flow at that situation, then they're actually pretty well protected. I mean, the the, the winter is always weathered best by those who have most uh, grain in the barn is always the, the mentality, I think, on this stuff. So if you, you've got a very, very large cash balance, if you've got a very large uh, you know, stockpile, then actually the, the ability to weather a lot of that winter um, be, given that we don't really know how long this, this problem in this first wave is really going to last, uh, it allows those organizations to really step forward to um, do things in this period of time that those other organizations who start moving much more to a, a defensive play um, just wouldn't be able to do. I think the other element on this um, is also with the organizations that we're, uh, we're seeing, the trend is very different from what happened with in 2008. Uh, at this period. Uh, very much if you kind of look at what happened in 2008, I mean the graphs from a share price perspective that with uh, regards to the banks looked very, very similar. But actually if you kind of look at the, the things that the, those organizations are doing, is very, very different. I mean in 2008 very much the, the setup was to retract back into everybody's shell and being, a, being in a situation where actually most organizations cut pretty much everything that, that was happening. Um, now, if I kind of look at the the reaction, uh, you know, in 2020 with everything that's happened happening with with Corona, then most organisations are seeing that um, while in 2008 digital was very much in its infancy, it wasn't something that was proven as a as a real uh, you know step change for for organisations in terms of both how they served their customers, but also how their efficiencies from an operational perspective. Uh, they could drive those things through. You know, very much in 08, digital was still being seen as taking people, taking paper out of a process. Whereas actually now, if you look at the uh, the 2020 landscape, then actually it's very much a, a setup where people see that uh, digital is is something they need to continue to invest in at this stage. Um, but I think the you know very much the um, the organisations that um, are most impacted by it do run the risk of of sort of really potentially being left behind in this period. But um, Benjamin, thanks for joining us back. I, we lost you just when you were saying about the, um, you looked at short, medium and long term. I think I kind of, kind of covered off a, a, quite a few of the short ones and given the massive gap that happened from a revenue perspective and actually a, a difference between two types of organization where with such reduced revenue, then actually some organizations are gonna be paralyzed by this. Um, those organizations who have very major cash reserves might be thinking very differently about how they act in this period. But do you see um, firms, though, that are within the, the sort of landscape um, that COVID will sort of leave behind, though? Yeah, I think there's um, a number of firms, uh, you know, across Europe, North America and elsewhere in the world that have largely ignored digital. Um, they've paid lip service to it. They've seen it as a sort of technology project something that IT people do or whatever. It's something that, yeah, you know, our customers don't really need. Um, and they've carried on with paper processes. And those firms are really hurting now because you know, they're having to send employees into offices to process applications. They can't do anything quickly. They can't uh, redesign things. Um, to be fair, in some cases, some regulators have been a bit slow to accept electronic signatures. So, you know, there's there's stories of people, you know, buying cars and signing the paperwork on the car bonnet because you have to have a wet signature in certain countries and so on. Um, but the big issue is financial services firms that haven't haven't understood the digital imperative, where the leaders didn't see the point, and the profits were good. You know, profits were good. I don't need to worry. I'm fine. And suddenly, you're not fine. <laughs> Yeah, it kind of creeps up on you when a global pandemic kicks in, doesn't it? So, uh, um, so I mean, 
we've, we've sort of talked about, and I've seen a lot of people kind of refer to this sort of, um, you know, pe there's people who are keep keep doing normal things, and then there are sort of people who are trying to discover this new normal. You know, look for the opportunity, look for the uh, the edge within this this sort of climate. Um, we've sort of said, you know, business as usual is essentially over because I think for those organisations who were sat there just hoping, you know, in I don't know, two months, three months, whatever it ends up being, we go back to the office and everything returns back to normal. Um, I just don't see that being the case, do you? No, I think I mean, obviously you have to follow the science, but the more you listen to doctors, um, we don't even know whether getting this virus once means you're immune from it subsequently. Um, it's clear that this is going to go on for a long time um, and that therefore we're not going to get back to what was normal for a long time. Therefore, we've got to do different things and find new ways through. Mm. And has the, I mean, in this first phase, uh, has there been a, a difference in what we've seen, the um, the impact of, I guess, more incumbent organisations and, uh, you know, newer challenges? Have you seen, you know, particular differences in terms of how they've responded to this, this crisis? I think the first thing to say is, is the response from many financial services firms has been fantastic. You know, we've seen lots of large banks, small banks, you know, digital lenders um, absolutely trying to do the right thing for their customers. You know, we've seen, um, you know, chief executives out on the front lines talking to customers, putting messages out and so on. We've seen um, a lot of banks, for example, being very quick to offer loan holidays and so on. Where you're starting to see the difference then is in their ability to do things like distribute the coronavirus business interruption loans or the payment protection in the, in the states and so on. There you're starting to see the digitized firms, the digital firms moving so much quicker, being able to get stuff done, um, getting things up very quickly. Some of the incumbent firms, particularly the traditionally minded ones, just struggling to change their processes, struggling to deal with the volumes, struggling to get contact center colleagues able to work from home, that sort of thing, and having to shut down their contact centers completely, tailing customers not to call because they can't mm -hmm. can't cope with that. Yeah, it's, and, it's, it, the the load is is unprecedented, isn't it? You know, I think I've I think I've worn out the word unprecedented over the last two months because exactly like you say, the, the loads that organizations are seeing into call centers or anything, just the, the triage for the volume of loans applications that they're actually seeing is just it is again unprecedented, isn't it? Yes, we start to run out of sort of superlatives. Uh, you have to think about the words you're using because you use the same ones over and over. <laughs> Um, so I, I guess, what do you think financial services firms can can do to sort of stay afloat in this period of time? Because given this this sort of short term shock, uh, how do people best respond? Do you think? Um, so the first thing is is you know do what's right for your customers and your employees. Right, fundamentally, this is a human crisis. So absolute top priority is look after your people, look after your customers. You know, if in doubt, do what's right um, for your customers and your people. Look after them. Um, then you've got to start looking at costs. Um, you know, revenues are not going to suddenly increase. Everyone's going to look for revenues, but there's not going to be lots of big new pools of revenues um, because, you know, if nothing else, the economy is shrinking. So you've got to look at where can we take costs out? Can we take out physical distribution costs? Have we got sites that we don't need? Have we got capacity that we don't need? Have we got software licenses we're paying for that we don't need? Have we got a software architecture that's extremely costly? So what we're seeing companies starting to do is accelerating change programs that were already in place, accelerating digital. So, um, you know, in traditional firms, you may find that robotic process automation is a, a bridge that helps you automate some of your existing paper processes. Ultimately, you need to digitize and rip and replace some of those processes anyway. Um, so getting that process redesign going, getting groups working to make your processes more efficient, more digital, picking Picking particular customer journeys, maybe, maybe don't pick the loan process right now because it's in such chaos, but pick some of your other customer journeys and start get them digitized. Look at where can we take out any cost, do that kind of customer journey yeah. mapping. Where have we got costs all the way through that process? How do we take those out? Um, yeah, well, like as you say in, in, that, um, in that, that sort of digitized process or uh, actually it very much changes the, the game, doesn't it? Because people are just looking to take complexity out of those processes as much as they can as quickly as they can because if you're if you know your loan application example if you've got an end-to-end -end loan application where in the middle is lots of breakage and lots of humans right now that process is just not going to work so 
I mean, what, what do you see sort of moving into that midterm then, Benjamin? How do you see uh, the impact being felt at that stage? So I think in the midterm, this is, you know, so over the next, um, well, sort of from now for the next three to nine months, depending on how long it takes to get control of the virus, we're clearly going to go into a, a deep recession, possibly a depression. So um, you're going to see all sorts of revenue lines under huge pressure um, as um, any kind of payment interchange fees drop sharply, you know, spendings drop by sort of 30, 40, 50%. Um, net interest income is right down because interest rates have fallen. Um, insurance companies' new premiums are going to fall with economic activity and so on. Uh, assets under management are falling, so fees are falling. Um, so you've got a period of very tight, um, very tight operations. So this is the time to really start looking at, okay, where can we take out costs? What can we digitize? What can we do more efficiently? Where can we also, you know, where, where have we got internal capabilities that we can potentially sell and start doing business in new ways? Because another thing that traditional firms have missed is the way that digital isn't just about costs. It isn't just about operating more efficiently. It's also about working completely differently with other companies and partnering. So, you know, look at, have you got, let's say, anti-money laundering capabilities or sanctions busting monitoring that you can offer to other companies as a service? Because what we see is the smart firms are not only digitizing those capabilities, they're then offering those capabilities as a service to other providers. Sometimes that might be retailers or merchants, or big corporations, other banks. So what are the internal capabilities you've got? Could you start generating new revenues from selling those? Um, you know, we don't need every bank in the world to be doing every single part of banking. Um, instead, we should have factories that are very good at very small pieces of it. So there's a whole sort of modularization of the banking industry and the insurance industry that needs to happen. Well, and, and when you're, uh, like say, an organization searching for revenue at that stage, then suddenly all of these things that were sort of nice to have before become you know, potentially very significant revenue streams into your organization that can keep things moving forwards. I mean, do you, do you think more broadly, I guess, in this medium and, and long term, that the crisis will actually accelerate that shift towards digital? It, it has to, because um, the industry has got to become more efficient. Um, and the only well, the, the biggest way to become more efficient is to become much more digital. Um, but also you're going to see, what you're going to see happening is the digital firms are going to start killing the traditional firms because they're so much faster, because they're so much lower cost. They're coming in and under a cutting. We've already seen that with the digital banks coming in and operating at much lower net interest margins than the, than the traditional banks. But you're seeing the same thing happening in insurance and investment management as new firms come in. The really scary thing, if you're a traditional firm now, is the digital giants. Um, yes, okay, some people are saying that you know Facebook and so on haven't covered themselves in glory so far. But if you look at particularly the Chinese ones, their capabilities, the things they've already done, um, and also the fact they've got big capital reserves, those firms are going to start pushing into financial services. They will they'll avoid the, the front end um, sort of regulated pieces, sorry, back-end regulated pieces, they'll avoid becoming regulated. But you'll see more and more firms doing what Apple has done with Goldman Sachs. Um, Goldman Sachs brings the financial know-how, Apple brings a consumer brand. Uh, they both have got very digital, very slick organi you know, organizations and processes, and bang, you've got some very compelling propositions that are very tough to compete with. And I think we're going to yeah. see a lot more of that. I completely agree. I mean, I think if you look at what happened in 2008 with the rise of, of everything that came from fintech, it correlated with a dip in the trust for traditional incumbent organizations. And I think, um, you know, in this time where banks are struggling to support SMEs and distribute funds, as, as you suggest, as well as, uh, I guess, from a retail perspective, you know, a, a normal human beings walking on the street perspective, later down the line in this medium and longer terms, then actually everybody's going to be impacted by these things. So I completely agree with you, Benjamin. I think if a, you know, along comes a, a tech giant with a brand and, you know, a, a disposition that everybody likes, um, whether it's Apple or Google or Facebook or whoever, then actually that could be a real uh, opportunity for them, but that would paint pretty dark territory, I, I, I think, for financial services, really. Um, so I, I guess, um, you know, in this climate, um, what's what's the upside? There's, because there's always opportunity, isn't there? There's always, within the, the spheres, there's always the opportunity to, you know, reinforce your brand or 
treat customers even more fairly or provide services that didn't exist anymore. I mean, is there a real opportunity, particularly for the incumbent organizations in this period, do you think? Yeah, and I think a big difference from 2008 is in 2008, some of the banks were directly to blame for many of the problems that hit the real economy. This time, you know, the banks are not to blame and they're, they're much better capitalized. And a lot of them have been doing the right thing and have, you know, have, have, have reacted really well so far. You know, um, in Spain, for example, bank, uh, BBVA and Santander have been buying ventilators and working with Zara to fly them to Spain um, to, you know, to help out the Spanish government. So a lot of traditional firms have been doing the right thing. Um, so yes, this is the sort of time when you really change customers' perceptions of you by doing the right thing um, and by being there for your customers. I think the opportunity comes from um, moving quickly to, to spot new opportunities and to help customers fast. And so the firms that are able to um, capitalize on new opportunities to bring out new propositions, to help customers with their financial well-being, their financial health, to give customers better advice, to help customers make better decisions, to extend those mortgages to help customers who are in trouble um, those are the ones that will really make a difference and the firms that are further down the digital journey are going to be much better place to do that i think you'll have a few other winners of the really well capitalized firms will come in and they will pick up smart people and clever technologies um, that have run out of runway uh, you know we're going to see a lot of fintechs and some established firms run out of money and some of those fintechs will get picked up by other players who say, wow, they've got great people, great technology, they're just unlucky. Let's have let's have that and make make our proposition better. So I think you're gonna see a lot of uh, acquisitions coming over the next uh, six to 12 months. I agree. Uh, some, some interesting comments and questions. Um, a lot of love for the report as well, Benjamin. So a lot of people are loving what you guys have been putting out. Uh, a question from Trevor Hunt. Uh, morning chaps, what's the 11FS house of you on recovery? Is it V-shaped, U-shaped or L-shaped? Uh, what do you think? Well, we're not economists, uh, and nor are we doctors. Um, the more I listen to the doctors, the more I think this is sort of L or W shape. This is not a quick recovery. This is going to be the biggest thing in our lives, I think, uh, hopefully, because uh, this is pretty horrendous for many. Normality. It's going to definitely not be linear. I think that's the uh, the, the definite sort of just on this one. So it's going to be much more of a squiggly line, I would have thought, than uh, than a V-shaped, U-shaped, or L-shaped. But I'm not sure any economist did agree with my squiggly line uh, predictions. So uh, um, Simon uh, Simon Taylor actually from 11FS dropped a comment on here as well, saying the FCA had to come out and say directly we're cool with digital signatures. Does this suggest that the issues is with big orgs themselves? Um, I think there's always something in that, isn't there, Benjamin, in terms of what the Bank of England or the FCA believe is possible and that organization should be doing, and then people's interpretation of those regulations. You know, very often the banks are more conservative than the regulators themselves, aren't they? So hopefully this realignment and a maybe a closer working with you know the FCA coming out and saying, look, this is fine, you guys can do this, it reduces the options for people internally on in companies who are there more to stop things happening than make things happen. Um, hopefully a little bit of that will go away. Yeah, we're lucky we've got a very forward looking regulator in, regulator in the UK. That's not the case in every other country, of course. Um, and you're right, compliance people tend to be a bit risk averse and it's sometimes easy to say, oh, I'm not sure that complies um, mm. than to actually do the work of talking to the regulator and say, check, or try and change the mind of the regulator, which you need to do in some countries. Agree. I mean, a lot of those, um, you know the points around um simon king had a good point on the the comments around um the you know really agree with the utility idea he says um but how do you get over those regulatory requirements in dif different jurisdictions i mean to your point there a lot of that is down to how you approach those things internally um you know what we've sort of seen is if one organization can make these things happen and there's many organizations globally in pretty much every jurisdiction doing these types of things, then if one person can do it, then it is possible. So it becomes more of a the inhibitor being your own organization than it is the environment that you work within, um, which is uh, sometimes a little bit conf uh, sort of confusing and complex for people to kind of get over is it's, uh, it's not them, it's you. Um, so, I mean, do you see people struggling, I guess, more, Benjamin, with the, the internal conditions really of their organization than they do necessarily the external ones? Yeah, because you have to do, a, as, a, as a digital leader, you have to do a lot of um, evangelization within your organizations. You have to get people to embrace change. Some people love change, some people hate change. Um, 
there's a lot of work to be done to get people to see why you need to change. If you're not working in a cross-functional way, a sort of multidisciplinary way, sometimes people in different departments, particularly if they're in different offices, don't see how their decisions are having a downstream impact on what customers can do and what the firm can offer. So bringing people together to show them the whole customer journey transforms the culture. Yeah. So, so what does this, you know, new normal look like then? Um, do we, in the medium and the long term, it feels sort of like organizations and actually people can benefit from this because it feels like actually this is potentially going to be the catalyst or, or at least the, the removal of an excuse that people have been holding on to for a decade, right? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a, there's a silver lining. There's some, you know, some horribly dark clouds. Um, you know, that this is a horrendous time for, for many people. But yes, um, there will be individuals who really benefit from this. And yes, I think just as, you know, the fintech uh, sort of industry really grew partly as a result of the global financial crisis, I think here again, we'll see an opportunity for um, companies that are thinking differently and people are thinking differently. Um, we'll see a huge opportunity to create new value to help other people through this through this crisis. So yes, I think there is absolutely an opportunity here. Um, and it will reshape the industry. I think we'll see some big firms disappear. Some big brands that we're all used to will go um, because they won't make it. Yeah, it's gonna be scary, isn't it? It's uh, when we're all some, uh, finally let outside of our houses, then uh, I, uh, I think the world will look, um, look pretty different from what it did before. All right, guys, uh, top of the hour now. So we're probably gonna have to skedaddle and go and get on with, uh, with our days. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Benjamin. Um, where can people find out a little bit more about you and what you get up to at 11FS? So um, I'm on LinkedIn, um, I'm on uh, Twitter, or come to 11FS's uh, website and uh, come and look at more of the research we've done and see, see what else we offer. Very good. Uh, the report you can go and find at info, uh, that's I-N-F-O dot 11FS.com forward slash COVID-19. So that's info dot 11FS.com forward slash COVID-19. Uh, the link will be in the comments as well if you want to kind of pick that up. If there's any more questions that we didn't get to that you want to ask uh, Benjamin, then uh, feel free to get in touch and we'll, we'll make sure that we answer all of those. We might even jump on a, a, another live stream and just go through all the comments because there's lots in them that we just didn't get the time to get to. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have for you today. We'll be here though same time tomorrow where I'll be joined by Deval Gore, who's the Head of Financial Business Services and Technology at London & Partners. If you don't know London & Partners, they're, the, they're London's International Trade Investment and Promotion Agency. Do a great job alongside the, the London Mayor to shout about everything that is, is going on in London. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe and we'll see you tomorrow.